2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1-6 through 6. I myself, Paul, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I ask that when I am present, I need not show boldness by daring to oppose those who think we are acting according to human standards. Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Let us pray. God of grace, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the good news that Jesus is Lord above all. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome to episode 22 of our series on 2 Corinthians. This is the first episode I've been able to do in a couple of months. The good news is that I am, with God's help, nearing the end of my doctoral project. I do ask that you pray for my successful completion. That said, I felt it was time for us to finish up our study on 2 Corinthians. We left off at the end of chapter 9 back in January, and it was fitting. And we now begin chapter 10. And you'll notice that this chapter marks a sort of sharp break in the letter. In fact, chapter 9 ended what had been a defense of Paul's ministry, a wonderful exposition of what it means to be a, a community of new creation in Christ, and closing words of exhortation to give and share in the burdens of the larger family of God. When you read chapter 10, the words suddenly turn sharp, and honestly, it looks like a new defense added on to what should have been a complete letter ending with chapter 9. There are a couple of ways to read this break. Many believe that this marks a different letter, perhaps a correspondence that was preserved and added later. Some think that this is a reply to a later response by the Corinthian community once they had read what we call 2 Corinthians chapter 1-9. through 9. Other scholars like N.T. Wright posit that this may be the product of the fact that Paul was writing on the road, and this is just a portion of the letter picked up at a later time, thus its relation to earlier points despite the disconnects. As the Owl and the old Tootsie Pop commercials used to say, the world may never know. We just don't have enough information to make an informed conclusion on how chapters 10 through 13 were meant to fit into 2 Corinthians. But Wright does give us an important clue. At the heart of these closing chapters is the looming question of power and authority. How is a Christian to understand power, especially within the church? What does it mean to have authority? These questions land us at an interesting intersection with our own day because at the heart of many of our what we call modern, postmodern problems, power and authority are seen as problematic categories. Can there be authority at all in a culture that relishes redefining everything or throwing off definitions in general? In a society where any and all exercise of power is suspect, is it possible to imagine what a just and a loving use of power might look like. Are we doomed to inhabit what scholars sometimes refer to as a hermeneutic of suspicion forever? Let me translate that. Must we live under the assumptions born of the legacy of thinkers like Feuerbach, Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx expressed in our cultural moment that all appeals to standards of truth are really just power plays or an attempt to wield power over others? In our race to be sophisticated and certainly not naive, Lord forbid, we seem committed to looking behind everything and in the process of seeing through everything, we often walk away having seen nothing at all. Again, I'm sorry, I had to wax a bit philosophic there to make the point, but here's where it intersects with scripture. Though it is a different context to be sure, Paul struggles along these lines with this Corinthian community and it helps us a great deal. There was a great deal of contention within the community over whose teachings ought to be listened to and the standards or ordinary measures of what power and authority look like when it's wielded, and more importantly, what the person in such a position would look like, sound like, dress like, what bearing they ought to have in relation to others in the community. To a culture that honored free Roman citizens, landowners, men, and the like as the pinnacle of power and respectability, how could this sophisticated Corinthian community 
be content with a ragamuffin apostle like Paul, who, when he spoke in person, was clearly not as sophisticated in order as his letters suggested and had nothing in the way of wealth or status. And he was a Jew. In other words, the first question right off the bat that Paul takes up when dealing with this contentious bunch is what power and authority look like and mean to a Christian community. And Paul does such a great job, I think. He speaks across the centuries to our own day because he makes it clear. Power and authority are defined by Jesus alone. In the cross of Christ, we see God surrender power in order to liberate us from the bondage of sin. In the gentleness and humility of Christ, referenced in chapter 10, verse 1, we see the truly human one who holds all authority surrender his hold on power in order to lift us into fellowship with God. As Paul goes on in verse 5, every proud obstacle, every measure of respectability, power, and authority we are likely to throw up within our human communities, they are destined to bend the knee to Jesus Christ in complete obedience to his love and grace. And here we take a parting lesson, lifted up in verse 3. We don't operate by the world's rules of the road. Our weapons against the arrogance of human pride aren't to fight fire with fire. We are not to bend others to the truth of the gospel by the exercise of power as traditionally defined. No, we are captives to Christ, so our power and our authority are exercised as Christ exercised his own. We are to live in a position of self-giving love. We are to live mutually submitted to one another. We are to love our brothers and sisters even as we love ourselves and certainly as God has loved us in Jesus Christ. And when we do, the power and authority that is wielded is of a different sort and it alone has the ability to change the world. Applied to our own lives and using Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 25, those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Whatever situation or burden you may be facing, True power and authority over it can only be exercised when we surrender its burden to God alone. In the process, as we will see in chapter 12, just a little while later, God's power is made perfect at exactly our point of greatest weakness. Let us pray. God, in Jesus Christ, we see that you are a wellspring of life. Though he was great, he surrendered himself so that we who are without hope might find new life. Help us line up our hearts and our lives according to his life-giving presence at work in us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.